Um, it is wonderful to be with you all this evening. And I want to thank uh, New Dawn and Jill for uh, making sure uh, that uh, tonight happened. Uh, I feel very humble following um, everyone who's performed so far. So uh, can't promise you anything other than a massive anticlimax um, <laughs> based on uh, the amazing stories we've heard so far. And it's just been fantastic to hear from everyone. And in a funny kind of way, what I'm going to be talking about, I hope will be reinforcing of uh, the stories we've heard so far and the music we've heard so far. Um, and it's a bit daunting when, when you're asked to land big ideas. Um, you know, I've got a very good friend and mentor, uh, a guy called Ed Freeman, who teaches at the University of Virginia. And he's the inventor of something called stakeholder theory. And uh, he, he's an incredible man. He, he's a mathematician, a musician, a philosopher, and a business prof. And he always jokes, he's a very um, self-effacing kind of guy. He says, you know, I may be a one-trick pony, but it's an okay trick. Um, and I, I feel like I'm a bit of a one-trick pony in terms of how I see the world and the kind of things we'll be talking about tonight. Um, but it is a philosophy based on assets and how we get the most out of assets. Uh, and I think what we've heard so far has been a brilliant example of how we build on assets in our community. So that's essentially what I'll be talking about. Not a special idea, not a big idea, not a new idea, but hopefully an important idea that um, you know, we can all share and hopefully reinforce. Uh, so uh, here's a test for, for everyone in the room. Um, anyone know who that comes from? Putting legs on ideas? Okay, all will come clear. So the, the, um, the, the, the notional title for tonight is uh, The Challenges of Change in Resource-Constrained Environments. And this is very appropriate at the moment as we try to uh, navigate the university sector through uh, resource constraints. And uh, I guess there's probably not a single person in this room who isn't navigating resource constraints one way or another. Um, but in a funny kind of way, um, sharing experiences of, of navigation, how we get the most out of what we all bring, uh, I think is a unifying notion. So hopefully we can talk about that. So what I'm going to be speaking about for the next 20 minutes um, are three things. Uh, a little bit of context, and, and uh, you know, I can't resist landing some messages about the um, One Nova Scotia report. Uh, which is being slowly rescued by the coalition. Um, but uh, I want to say something about dwelling in negativity. Uh, I want to say something about uh, change. Uh, and then I want to say what inspires me, because that was one of the standard questions from Jill, what keeps me going. So I'm going to share a little bit about that. And then maybe talk about some uh, big changes that are going on that you know we can surf, we can ride some big changes if we're smart and if we play to our strengths. So does that sound okay for 20 minutes? Would anyone like to do something entirely different? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm nothing if not a Democrat, so uh, if we can whip up a quick vote on something different, we'll do it. But no, hearing nothing, let's press on. So um, uh, this thing that ranking and a bunch of smart people are trying to rescue at the moment, uh, which is this huge analysis of what's wrong with Nova Scotia and why it's all over for us. Um, you know, I think the, the, the analysis is important. It, it, it's useful to a certain extent, although it has been pointed out that we've had 10 such pieces of analysis over the last 100 years. And uh, the one Nova Scotia report is just one in a long list of, of, of reports that say it's all over. Um, but I, I just want to run a brief thought experiment. Uh, so let, let's read this uh, quote from the one Nova Scotia report. The single most significant impediment to change in real is the lack of a shared vision and commitment to economic growth and renewal across our province and among our key institutions and stakeholder communities. So feeling good about that? Uh, try this. Some things you can control, some things you can't control. 
Nova Scotia needs to focus on what it can control, growing the economy and creating wealth. With all due respect to our Premier, the glass is not half full, it's a quarter full at best. So who's feeling good now? <laughs> um, are we ready to go out there and prove what's possible? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and this was from uh, an Ames conference, uh, which was entitled, For the Love of Nova Scotia, uh, Let's Focus on the Economy, uh, the Ivney Report, one year later. Uh, That's ironic after the, what he's just done with the uh, film industry. Oh, the premium. Oh, Risley. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, fine fellow. Um, but I guess what I'm talking about here is the language and, and what brings an appeal to action rather than uh, suicide. Um, let's try this. This is, this is a bit better, I think. Oh, oh. skipped. Uh, we will have become a province that our own skilled and ambitious people feel no, no necessity to leave, that people who have left in the past are able to return, and that other Canadians and international immigrants will want to come to for the excellent quality of life and economic opportunities. Slightly more useful language, I think. Uh, it's from the same report, right? And my, my gentle case here is that we can pull from that report, which has got a million things in it, uh, either stuff that takes us to a sad and depressing place, or we can pull from it stuff that takes us to a positive and empowering place. And what's good when you start with the empowering stuff is that you can start thinking about, you know, things like youth and international student retention. You can start putting numbers to it. You can start saying, what would it look like if we doubled the amount of immigration or trebled the amount of immigration, if all of our smart international students at CBU, some of whom are in the room, were able to stay and settle here? Wouldn't that be good, right? So suddenly we can use statistics, goals, and strategies to, to help us think through, again, to a better place. Um, and then it gets even better you start seeing people doing things. Um, and this is where I think the coalition is helping because it seems to me that, unlike the analysis that, that says we're all going to hell in a handcart, now or never, or now or sometime, um, the coalition is at least trying to breathe life into action and positive examples of change. So I pulled this off, off uh, the internet just last night and it, and it, it, it um, appealed to me because I know the Norman Newman Centre, it's in the faculty management at Dalhousie, which I used to look after. And what this little event was talking about was, again, you know, showcasing immigrants who have come to Nova Scotia, set up businesses, done things, employed people. Uh, so we've got the vision from the One Nova Scotia report, we've got some goals and metrics, and now we've got some action. Uh, so this, this is a beautiful example of, of Fusion Halifax, all of you know, Fusion, I'm sure, uh, pulling together with academia and with immigrants and business uh, a set of uh, options and ideas that can replicate and that can, can give us a sense of forward momentum. And of course here, I don't know what I should be pointing this at. Uh, ah, here in Cape Breton, uh, and Alva is in the room working on this project. We've just recently been uh, working on an immigration strategy for rural Cape Breton and urban Cape Breton. Uh, and again, uh, I think this is a very elevating and exciting project that involves academic institutions, it involves municipalities, it involves community organizations, it involves business, it involves chambers of commerce, it involves our First Nations, and something is happening. So what the original quote comes from is Jimmy Tompkins. So you all know Jimmy Tompkins, of course, who uh, a few years ago said this, it's not enough to have ideas, we have to put legs on. And I think we put legs on ideas by talking and acting in a way that is possibilities driven rather than negativity and analytically driven. And that, I think, is... The big idea here, uh, but not a big idea that any of you would have any difficulty with or don't know anyway, because uh, you wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, but strangely enough, this is not necessarily where everyone in Nova Scotia lives their lives, because we do have this predilection to dwell in the miserable, 
uh, and to drag each other down, criticize institutions, criticize leaders, criticize whoever. And we've just got to stop doing that. We have just got to stop doing that. So, this is interesting. Oh, there we are. We had David Cooper Ryder from him. So, anyone heard of David Cooper Ryder or Appreciative Inquiry? Uh, I came across this as a technique. I was sent by my former boss, who was also very positive and eterotic around the body shop, to a course in Taos in New Mexico, where I spent a week learning about this technique, Appreciative Inquiry. And, and whilst Appreciative Inquiry may be a little bit too social constructivist for some, uh, I think there's a lot of merit in approaches to organizational change, political change, conflict resolution, and so on, which are focused on what's possible rather than what's not working. And David Cooper Ryder's work over the years has been fascinating because what he has proven, really, and, and shown through building an international movement of consultants who work around appreciative inquiry is that if you can just suspend for a moment uh, thinking around what's not working, thinking about what's wrong, and just imagine what could be really great, uh, then suddenly you free up your thinking, you free up your creativity, and you can transcend the negative and the, and the downward spiraling uh, rhetoric that otherwise uh, you can get stuck in. Ignore the political reality. Well, that's a point, right? So a debate I had with David Cooper Ryder was that you, know, you can't socially construct your way into everything. Uh, there is something called objective reality, which you have also got to deal with. But the trick here is not to spend your entire lives in objective reality, uh, because if you do that, nothing will change. So you need these things in creative tension. Uh, and my view is we have to put the focus on the appreciative to help drag us beyond the objective and the negative, which stops people acting. So where do I find inspiration? Uh, I've done a lot of work um, in international development over the years, and uh, one of the countries I spent some time in in the 80s and have gone back to since uh, is Sudan. And some of you may know we've just won a big contract to work on uh, health uh, uh, issues in South Sudan, which is the new bit of Sudan that cleaved off a few years ago. When I first went to Darfur in the 1980s, uh, which was then very poor, uh, still is very poor, but now has lots of conflict on top of the poverty. I was struck by people's attitude, people who have nothing effectively compared to us, people who are scraping by on virtually zero financial resources. And yet, uh, there are community support networks. There are people who pull together on agricultural and other activities. And having spent months and months and months uh, in Darfur and in similar places to Darfur in the 1980s, uh, I learned this big lesson, and it's stuck with me ever since, uh, that you can have your objective reality. You can have uh, really tough and difficult circumstances, but you can also have a way of transcending that. Uh, if you have people around you, if you have social networks, if you have uh, some resources, but you don't have to be rich. And so whenever I find myself tempted to dwell too long, normally it's only a few milliseconds, but too long in the negative, I just think back to this, right? And I think back to the fact, um, we've worked in Darfur in, in recent years as well, that there are still people in Darfur today who are dealing with all this stuff, uh, terrible stuff, and yet they're still being entrepreneurial, they're still selling stuff, they're still um, going out and making things happen, even though in our terms they have almost nothing. So that's a good reminder for me when I find myself occasionally tempted to uh, spend too long thinking about what's not working. Where I like to spend more time is couldn't everything be great? And certainly here in Cape Breton Island, everything is great and can be even better. And there are so many assets, so many resources that we can draw on. Uh, not all financial, uh, but in the end, it's not the financial resources that will make the difference. You know, we can always find money. There's always ways to fundraise. There's always ways to bring communities together to, to get the 
bare minimum finance to get stuff done. What really matters is what we can create with the people, with the networks, and the resources and assets that we can bring to bear. So some of this you will recognize, it's got a bit of a CBU slant to it, but you know, we can think about all the amazing assets we have in Cape Breton Island, and they are assets that no other community on the planet, I don't believe, can match. Uh, we just have to recognize that and think about that and bring together the different parts of the puzzle that you know, perhaps we haven't brought together as well as we might so far. I even have holy angels in there, so that's a little nod in the direction of, of the social innovation that we uh, thank um, New Dawn for. So that's the second way I find inspiration, uh, thinking about how good it can get. So um, I'll speed up now because I just want to talk about three little examples of, of, of areas where there's massive change, where you could get spooked or where you could think, ah, we could harness the fact there's massive change going on, do something about it, get involved in it, make it really special here in Cape Breton. So one is the future of universities, um, which is where I spend uh, some of my time uh, when I'm not out misbehaving myself in other ways. Um, universities are going through a tough time globally. Uh, Nova Scotia is no different. Cape Breton University is no different. Uh, and there's all kinds of factors driving that which uh, we can talk about. But you can also say, as is in this quote here, that universities have been around a long time and they will be around for many, many years to come. The question is, will they be in the same form as they have been? So this quote of the 33 institutions that survived to our times from the 16th century, 29 are universities. But those, those universities look very different today than they did in the 16th century. And they're certainly going to look very different again in 20 or 30 or 40 years' time for all kinds of reasons. So is it enough just to survive, or do you have to change and surf the change? My view is you have to surf the change. So here we are. Here's all the good stuff. You know, If you listen to most university presidents, I'll tell you how wonderful it all is, um, and all the great things we're doing for our province, all the great things you know, we're doing for our region, and all of that is true. But is it enough? My answer, no, it's not enough. Because we have to be ahead of the change. We have to surf the change. And CBU wants to surf the change. We want to be there pushing forward the reinvention of universities, not sitting on entitlement and history, which is always the temptation if you're in a university. So here's why the revolution is coming. There are forces at play which are absolutely unstoppable. And it means that if CBU doesn't change, if Dalhousie doesn't change, if University of Toronto doesn't change, we're all dead, right? So therefore, it's incumbent on us, and certainly for a university like CBU in a community like Cape Breton Island, to change, to update, to get ahead of those big forces that will otherwise make us irrelevant. So all these things need to be dealt with. Um, they can't be ignored. Energy, another favorite topic of mine. Uh, massive disruptive change coming in energy. Uh, and uh, a lot of it is incredibly positive uh, because we're moving away from the kind of vertically integrated monopoly utility model where you've got a company or a public corporation generating power in big power stations, distributing the power through long, inefficient wires to the grateful customers who then switch on their lights and pay huge amounts of money for the privilege. That model is dying, and it's dying very quickly. Except in Nova Scotia. Well, we'll talk about that. So the reason it's dying is because alternatives are becoming not just available, but cheaper. And if you look at places like California, uh, solar now is much cheaper in terms of levelized costs. So you take the cost of installation, the cost of running the facilities, stretch it out over time, it's cheaper. You take storage. Uh, storage technology, you may have seen what Tesla's up to at the moment, you know, making every home potentially a self-reliant battery and we all you know, 
can drive our motor vehicles on, on electricity in due course. And you take all this together, you take the shift to renewables, you take um, efficiency, uh, you take the availability of smart grids, and you look at what this means for utilities. And the green line here is status quo, so if, if we just continued on, that's what uh, utilities would be selling us all in terms of, this is the European Union, by the way, in terms of electricity. But if you look at how um, all of these different factors coming together might impact on the utilities, you end up with a red line. So you're almost halving the demand that electrical ut utilities uh, will be offering. At that point, they're all dead, right? Because their model depends on big power stations, inefficient grids, and us paying the price. Uh, and so interesting, when you poll, I won't go into the details here, but when you poll energy utility executives privately, they admit, they don't say it publicly, but they will admit privately, it's all over. The model we've currently got today is gone, and it's going in the next 10 or 20 years. So what does that mean for Cape Breton Island or Nova Scotia? Let's get ahead of the curve. Let's be part of that new future for energy generation and use, uh, using the assets that we have available to us. Final revolution, tourism. Uh, this is an area that CBU is very interested in. It's an area that Cape Breton Island is very interested in, and quite right too, because we have the most beautiful natural resources, the most beautiful touristic locations on the planet. So what would it look like if we were to uh, have more tourism here, in the Ivany report, they talked about doubling tourism. I think for Cape Breton Island, um, what we could do with tourism uh, knows no bounds. And interestingly enough, the, uh, the graphs on where the new tourists are coming from uh, are not Europe, not North America. It's China, Russia, and other locations. And of course here we have many students from China who are learning about hospitality and tourism. Uh, we have MBA students from China who might want to develop tourism businesses. Um, we are enormously well placed, uh, again, to surf this wave. You know, we could spend the next 10, 20 years trying to incrementally gain a few more Americans coming to Cape Breton Island. We might be successful. Keep the Yarmouth Ferry going, we, we might pull it off. M more interesting, from my point of view, is to use our people, our social networks, our international connections, and see what it looks like to uh, tap into the massive growth in Chinese tourism, given the people we have here in the networks that we're part of. So uh, those are my three revolutions, all with uh, potential opportunities for Cape Breton Island. And where that takes me to is a way of thinking about how we have to work together. Again, this won't be new to anyone in this room, I'm sure. The fact that there are different sorts of assets, different forms of capital that we can draw on, pull together, and synergize. So yeah, of course, it's important to have money. Uh, it's important to have financial capital. But it's not the game changer. Usually, the game changer you know, for anything that's entrepreneurial, anything that's new, is people and networks. Right? Uh, most people who start a business start a business because their parents or their family or their friends lend them a bit of cash, but they then also create the space to operate. So Gavin Uma, you know, working in his mum's basement, right? Then, you know, hugely successful, able to deliver amazing things for the world, and now delivering UIT in the Holy Angels site, the Center for Social Innovation here in Cape Breton. So networks and people natural capital, every bit as important as access to money. But to, to hear conventional business people, you'd think it's only about money. It's not. No one ever got a good idea going just with money. Uh, and so when we think about, uh, this is Jimmy Tompkins again, uh, when we think about um, all the assets we've got here, all of the different forms of capital we can draw on, if we can bring a mindset that is linguistically positive, is can do, is talking about what's possible rather than what's not working and what's broken. Um, we've got everything to play for here, everything. But I would encourage us to always think 
positive and always think about assets and drawing on the different forms of assets and, and drawing on the knowledge that these assets can kind of be fungible. You know, we can, we can take human capital, people, uh, and turn it into networks. The example of tourism from China. Uh, we can turn those people, that human capital, that social capital, into financial capital, because if tourists come here, they'll spend money in Cape Breton Island, which then circulates around the economy, and that helps the economy grow in a good way. Uh, if we stay focused on our cultural assets, which are second to none, globally, second to none. We've heard much about that today already. Theatre, music. These are enormous sources of strength to our community, enormous sources of potential opportunity and growth for Cape Breton Island. So um, I'll finish there, Mary Beth. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some questions. Uh, very happy to deal with any questions. But I, I hope I've left you uh, with a sense, anyway, of how I think and how I uh, run my um, life. Uh, but more importantly, how I think we can all help uh, in terms of steering conversations to what's possible and what's good uh, and steering our discussions around how we grow our community around the amazing assets that we have to build on and to leverage. So thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you.